As a small child, we moved to a new neighborhood, and I was violently bullied for a number of years. My escape was science. At every opportunity, I would run out into the fields, the woodlands, and the riverbanks near where we lived, and I'd identify all the little creatures that I would find there using field guides that I carried in my backpack. My childhood hero was Jacques Cousteau, a scientist himself, and every week I would watch his TV show and marvel at how he discovered new life beneath the ocean waves. Today, I am a scientist, and I discover life where it should not exist. My work has taken me from the icy polar deserts of Antarctica to boiling hot springs on the roof of the world in Tibet, and to pink soda lakes where the water is ten times more salty than the ocean. The vivid colours you see are caused by extremophiles. These are tiny microorganisms that are adapted to living under harsh environmental conditions. I've spent many years working in Antarctica, in a place called the McMurdo Dry Valleys. This is the coldest, driest desert on the planet. And when I first went there, my boss told me, "You're crazy. You'll never find any life there. What are you doing?" I landed, got out of the helicopter, and put my feet on the ground. And the first thing that happened was I kicked over a small white rock. It was a piece of quartz. The underneath of that white rock was bright green. Immediately, my curiosity was aroused. I got out my trusty geological hammer and I tapped a piece of sandstone. And then a piece of granite, and they too were green. They were green because I discovered extremophiles, tiny microscopic plants that were green because they behave just like plants and trees, harvesting sunlight to create their energy to survive in this harsh environment. My research has helped to redefine the limits for life on Earth. And combined with the knowledge that the surface of other planets is also like some of these harsh environments that I've been to, it's helped to fuel the notion that life itself could be multi-planetary. In fact, space research for many years has been firmly focused on finding a second genesis for life. A lot of that work has focused on the planet Mars. Mars is our closest neighbor, and there are many missions that have gone up to explore this planet. It's cold, it's dry, it's very similar in many ways to the McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. So the question is, is there life on Mars? Well, scientists are confident that there is, and in fact, the U.S. space agency NASA have made a bold statement that within 10 years they will deliver proof of life on another planet. They've deployed many rovers to the surface of Mars, and in fact, even as I speak to you today, the Mars Curiosity rover is on the surface of Mars, drilling holes to try and establish the conditions for life and where they exist. So it does seem likely then that our first encounter with aliens is not going to be with little green people. It's actually going to be with little green microbes. But there's a problem. Because microbes, as well as living in extreme places, also cause disease—not just in humans, but also in animals and plants. And so, as we start to explore other planets and bring samples of microbes from other planets to Earth and send astronauts to explore those planets themselves, we'll need to have a much more amped-up biosecurity. So, if you think airport security now is bad, just think what it's going to be like in the future. So the prospect of finding aliens—it's—it's it's a bit of a freaky concept. Even little microbial aliens is tough to get your head around. But I'm here to tell you that the situation is about to get a whole lot more complicated, and that's because of this. NASA's space telescope Kepler is up there in the heavens, and it's discovered already thousands of Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. It's been estimated there may be up to 40 billion other Earth-like planets in our galaxy, the Milky Way. That's more than five each for every single man, woman, and child on this planet. So, finding alien life is no longer a question of science fiction. We're now looking at a scientific reality.
<laughs> I thought you'd like that. <laughs> beyond this, though, beyond science, how are we going to feel about the discovery of alien life? For me, I grew up in a church school in a fairly religious environment, but I'm a scientist. So I've always been fascinated at the interplay between faith and science. Would the discovery of alien life sway faith? I think not. You can think of examples in our past where science has made incredible discoveries that have not affected people's faith. Copernicus, upon resolving that the Earth was not the center of the universe, but rather revolved around our star, the Sun, and was part of a wider solar system, did not shake faith. Charles Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection did not shake faith. And so it seems to me very unlikely that faith will be negatively impacted by the discovery of alien life unless there is a fundamental change in our sense of purpose as human beings. And what's very interesting is that many churches have shown a remarkable enthusiasm to embrace the idea of alien life. The Catholic Church has willingly admitted that there may be other planets out there that support life. And in an encyclical, which is an official papal announcement, Pope Francis has said that he would be very happy to baptize an alien. <laughs> it's true, by the way, yes. This is a far cry from the church of old. In the 16th century, another Catholic, Giordano Bruno, who was a friar in Italy, was burned alive at the stake for daring to suggest there might be other earths up there in the heavens. We can also, too, probably learn some very useful lessons from our own history. Human history, rather sadly, is peppered with examples of rather unfortunate encounters between First Nation peoples and alien colonists. Consider Cortez, the Spanish explorer. He set foot in what is now Mexico in 1519, and he and his men marveled at the beauty and sophistication of the Aztec Empire. But this didn't stop them within a year from enslaving the people and forcing them to work and deliver gold, and from, albeit inadvertently, introducing diseases such as smallpox, which wiped out nearly five million people within a year of his landing. But that's not the worst thing to befall the Aztecs, because within one generation, forced into breeding and religious conversion had caused fundamental changes to the genetic makeup the physical appearance, and the culture of the Aztecs. And essentially, they had ceased to exist. And so, as we move forward with the scientific knowledge that we are going to encounter alien life, we need to ask ourselves a question. As we become part of an interstellar civilization, are we going to be the colonists or the Aztecs? Thank you.